Welcome to Radiologist Headquarters. I'm Dr. Dan Koval, and it's time for five cases in five minutes, vascular imaging number three. I'm going to show each unknown case slide for about 10 seconds, and you can pause to study the images further if you'd like. I'll then review the findings, reveal the diagnosis, and move to the next case. Ready? Let's go. Case one, slide one of two, CT angiogram. Slide two of two, non-contrast CT chest. Okay, so on these contrast enhanced images, you can see that there's a hypodense rind of soft tissue surrounding the descending thoracic aorta. And you might initially think that this is mural thrombus, but notice how smoothly marginated it is. And also on this coronal oblique reformatted image, it extends the length of the descending thoracic aorta, which would be very unusual for mural thrombus. And again, it's very smoothly marginated. So this is typical for a type B intramural hematoma. So acute aortic intramural hematomas are part of the acute aortic syndrome spectrum, and they're caused by rupture of the vasoforum, causing hemorrhage into the aortic wall. So it's different than aortic dissection because there's no intimal tear. So that's why you only see contrast in the lumen of the aorta and not within this intramural hematoma. They can also be caused by penetrating atherosclerotic ulcers, and they're treated like aortic dissections because they can evolve into dissections. So this would be a type B intramural hematoma because it's distal to the brachiocephalic artery. And non-contrast images are extremely helpful when evaluating for intramural hematoma because you can see more clearly the hyperdense hemorrhage within the wall of the aorta. And also in this case, you notice that there's some mediastinal hemorrhage, which is a potential complication of intramural hematoma. So if I just go back here, you can see that this hemorrhage within the wall appears hypodense relative to the extremely bright contrast in the lumen. And that's why the non-contrast images are helpful. It kind of confirms that. All right, next case, coronal CT angiogram, abdomen and pelvis, cine clip. Slide two of two, axial and sagittal CT angiogram. All right, so looking at this coronal cine clip, you can see that there's a large infernal abdominal aortic aneurysm here, and we also have an aortic endograft, so there's been an endograft repair. But then notice that we have contrast within the excluded aneurysm sac here. This should not be here. We should just see non-opacification of the sac, like in this area. And then if you look further at the graft, you can see that there's disconnect here at these two modular components. So the axial images here show, again, this large abdominal aortic aneurysm, status post endograft repair, and you can see that here's the right limb and the left limb, and then you notice contrast within the excluded sac. So that tells you that there's an endoleak. And then you can see that here's the actual disconnected limb, and that's where the contrast is spilling out into the aneurysm sac. And we can see that much better on the sagittal reformatted image here, showing that there's the limb here that's disconnected and the contrast is spilling out into the sac. So this is typical for a type 3A endoleak. And often with type 3 endoleaks, the reformatted images better show the graft disconnect. So these are 3D MIP reconstructions, and you can see that this one, again, shows the disconnected limb on the sagittal image, and then here we can see it on the coronal image very nicely. Here's the normal contralateral limb, and this is how it should normally be connected. All right, so let's talk about endoleak classification. We reviewed this in vascular imaging part two, so we'll just briefly go over this again. Type one is when you have seal failure between the aorta and the graft ends, and that's most common after thoracic aortic aneurysm repair. So 1A occurs at the proximal aspect of the graft, and 1B is at the distal aspect. And if you have failure at the level of the iliac occluder in the abdomen and pelvis, that's type 1C. Type 2 endoleaks occur when you have retrograde filling of the excluded sac from collateral flow, usually from one of the lumbar arteries or the inferior mesenteric artery, and that's most common after abdominal aortic aneurysm repair. Type 2A is when you have just a single vessel causing retrograde filling. Type 2B is multiple vessels. Type 3 endoleaks occur when you have a gap between the graft components or a tear in the graft. So separation of the components is a type 3A, which is what we have in this case. Type 3B is when you have a fracture or a hole in the endograft, which is much less common. Type 4 is graft porosity, and type 5 is endotension, when the aneurysm sac just increases for no apparent reason. All right, case 3, slide 1 of 3, history of enlarging AAA multiphase axial CT. Slide two of three, volume rendered reformat of the aortoiliac junction. Slide three of three, sagittal and volume rendered reformatted images. 
Okay, so here we're looking at non-contrast arterial phase and delayed phase images of the abdominal aorta. And this is a typical multi-phase CTA evaluation for endoleak. So the non-contrast images tell you if there's any intrinsic hyperdensity within the excluded sac lumen. And here we don't see any density here like calcification in the lumen. And here you see the normal appearance of the endograph. On the arterial phase, though, you can see that there's contrast within the endograph, which is normal, but then there's also contrast leaking out into the excluded aneurysm sac. So this is abnormal. You don't normally want to see any contrast in the excluded aneurysm sac. And we know this is real because we have a non-contrast image showing no density there. So if this image showed density here, we could assume that this is actually just calcification within a thrombose lumen. And then on the delayed phase image, you can see that there's a continued accumulation of contrast spilling out of the endograft into the excluded aneurysm sac, and that just kind of confirms endoleak. Also, what phase of contrast are we in for the kidneys in these two images? Yes, cortical medullary and nephrographic. Now, if we look at this rotating 3D volume rendered image of the graft, you can see that the modular components of the graft appear intact. There's no detachment of that pant leg like we saw in the last case. However, look at this. There's splaying of the graft mesh apart. There's a focal defect here in the graft, and there's contrast focally extending out through this hole. And here on the left-hand side, we have sagittal reformatted MIP images of the endograft. Here's the endograft here, showing that focal splaying apart of the mesh work. And then there's actually contrast extending out of that defect into the excluded aneurysm sac. And in general, with endograft evaluation, the 3D volume rendered images often show the actual material of the graft much better. And here you can see even better that there's this defect here within the meshwork, and there's contrast spilling out into the excluded sac. So there's a hole in the endograft. So what type of endoleak is this? Yes, type 3B endoleak. So again, the type 3B leak is when you have a fracture or a hole in the endograft, and that's much less common than the type 3A, which is when you have the separation of the modular components. And one thing I didn't mention before when talking about type 3 endoleaks, how are these treated? Well, these tend to be treated rather urgently because they will not resolve spontaneously, and usually additional scent graft components are placed across the defect. All right, case four, history of abdominal pain, single slide. Okay, so on the left-hand side, we've got non-contrast images showing a very large abdominal aortic aneurysm. There's some peripheral calcification in the wall, but more importantly, there's this heterogeneous hyperdensity within the mural thrombus, and it's even more pronounced anteriorly here. Looking a bit more inferior on this image, we do see again this irregular hyperdense material within the wall of the abdominal aortic aneurysm. Now, when we give intravenous contrast on these right-hand images, and we're in an angiographic phase here, cortical medullary phase of the kidneys, we don't see any contrast extending outside of the aorta to indicate rupture, and there's no surrounding hematoma. But you do see this fissuring of contrast entering into the mural thrombus. It's coming very close to the outer wall of the abdominal aorta. So what would you worry about in this case? Right, impending abdominal aortic aneurysm rupture. So this hyperattenuating crescent sign, as well as this thrombus fissurization, are both findings that raise suspicion for an impending AAA rupture. So that hyperattenuating or hyperdense crescent sign is actually caused by fresh blood that first insinuates itself into the wall of the mural thrombus and then later penetrates into the aortic wall itself. So the pathophysiology is different than that from intramural hematoma where the hemorrhage starts within the wall. This actually starts in the lumen and then extends out. So even if you don't see aortic rupture, meaning you don't see contrast or hemorrhage surrounding the aorta, this finding is still really suspicious for an impending rupture and you need to convey that to the referring physician. And studies have actually shown that the specificity is over 90% when you see the hyperdense crescent sign that there's a complicated aneurysm so other findings of potential aortic rupture are when you see this thrombus fissure because the wall is becoming thin and may become compromised. Also, if aneurysm is very large, like greater than 7 centimeters in the abdominal aorta. And also if you see evolving discontinuity of calcification around an aneurysm. All right, last case, case 5, history of esophageal perforation, CT angiogram of the chest. Okay, so what's going on here in this complex case? So if we look at this left-hand upper image at the aortic arch here, notice how there's fluid and a hyperattenuating rim surrounding the descending thoracic aorta. So this indicates that there's some type of inflammation of the aorta. There's an aortitis going on here. And then if we move inferiorly on this lower axial image, you can notice that there's a saccular outpouching from the left aspect of the descending thoracic aorta, surrounded by multiple foci of gas and this rind of soft tissue and fluid. The coronal images nicely show that this aneurysm is very saccular and somewhat bizarre and irregular in shape. It has a beaked appearance here. Again, we see these multiple foci of gas surrounding it along with soft tissue and fluid. 
And this is typical for a mycotic aneurysm of the descending thoracic aorta. So mycotic aneurysms occur in the setting of infection of the arterial wall, and they're usually bacterial, often from hematogenous spread of a bacterial infection, typically from infective endocarditis. But you can also have direct seeding, direct involvement from an adjacent infection, and that's what occurred in this case. The patient had an esophageal perforation that seeded this area and then evolved into this mycotic aneurysm. So clues to the fact that you're dealing with a mycotic aneurysm are you'll see this fluid and aortitis of the adjacent aorta. There'll often be multiple foci of gas surrounding the aneurysm, and it tends to be a saccular as opposed to fusiform aneurysm with an irregular multilobulated shape. So you don't normally see beaked shapes like this when you're dealing with aneurysms. And they often occur in areas that are not typical for atheromatous disease. Like you don't typically get atherosclerotic related saccular aneurysms in this location with this shape. And here we have some more coronal reformatted images showing that hyperenhancing rim surrounding fluid indicating aortitis. And again, there's that multilobulated irregular mycotic aneurysm surrounded by numerous foci of gas. And if you're ever wondering, are you dealing with gas or not, sometimes switching to lung windows can help. And that indeed confirms that we are dealing with multiple foci of gas coalescing about this aneurysm indicating an adjacent abscess. So these can have a very high mortality and tend to be treated with endograft or surgical repair following antibiotic treatment. Hey, that's it for five cases in five minutes, vascular imaging number three. I hope you enjoyed this lecture, and if so, please subscribe to Radiologist Headquarters on Apple Podcasts and YouTube. It would be dynamite if you shared these lectures with even just one person or left a podcast review. You can also leave a comment or a question on YouTube, and I'll do my best to answer it. Visit us at radiologisthq.com for more info and to follow us on social media to get updates. Thanks and have a great day.